You, you get the idea. I'm saying the same spirit on a person has different manifestations, right? The, the spirit that's on Bill causes people to see things that have never been seen before. I'd like to propose that this city will be famous in five years as a spirit, as a place where people get breakthroughs into all kinds of inventions, innovation, science, medical inventions, and that there'll be a university in our city that becomes the research capital of the US. And that people will find brilliant ideas and solutions, and they will see things that have never been seen before. And I'm talking about medical solutions, science solutions, because this place is a place of revelation. It's not just on our house, it's on the houses in the city, and now it's in our city. Our, our encounter with God is redefining our city. I see it's Highway 5. It's the highway of grace, are you with me? With the Sacramento River running through it. And along the river, I see that there's going to be um, think tanks from you know, Apple and HP and Microsoft. They will come here to revelate to R&D, to think, and they'll be like, oh, there's just a beautiful place there along the river, you'll really love it. But what they don't understand is what's really drawing them is something in a dimension that Musk doesn't know about. Are you with me? And therefore, we are shaping a new destiny for our city. This is what we're doing. You're like, I don't know what I'm doing here. You may not, but I know what you're doing here because I've been praying for people. Lord, send us world changers. Lord, send us people that think big. S send us people who can, that have the confidence to go, hey, I think we should go to Mars. I'm thinking. I uh, need some folks that can build a rocket. We don't need people who have fantasies. We need people that dream the dreams of God. There's enough people that have fantasies that never do anything. <laughs> we had the men together, I don't know, it's probably three weeks ago. Four or five hundred men gathered. And I started thinking, I'm supposed to get these men pregnant. These men need to be pregnant with a vision for our city. They need to wake up in the morning and say, this is my city, and that crap doesn't happen in my city. This stuff is supposed to happen in my city. And I said to the men, men, this is your city. And they're like, yeah, yeah. I said, no, 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 this is your city. When you see a homeless person, that's not a homeless person, that's your homeless person. See, Jesus said you'll always have the poor with you. The goal is to always have poor people with you. I know middle class people, they want to put the poor people, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want them on my steps. I don't want them over here. I don't want them. Well, they're your people. God sends them to the place where you'll pay attention. How I many you know a noble city is marked by how it takes care of the people who have no recourse? Let me say it again. A noble city is marked by the way it deals with the people who have no recourse. How do you deal with people who can't give back to you? What do you do with people? How many know the goal isn't to get rid of the poor, the goal is to take care of the poor. And not give them a hand up, but give them a handout. Thank you, Chris, for that. Number four, the attributes of an apostolic people. Did you remember what we're doing? <laughs> Number four, we're almost done, 11 minutes. You endure till the end, you'll be saved. <laughs> Number four, we believe in a fantastic future. Therefore, we have a 100-year vision that necessitates a positive eschatology. How many know that if we're going to actually change culture we actually have to believe that we're going to be here for a while. I know it's good. They just don't know it. In Jeremiah 29, 11, probably one of the most quoted verses, I know the plans I have for you. Do you know when Jeremiah quoted that? 
It's when they were in the 20th year, approximately, of a 50-year exile in the Babylon. And God said to them, I know the plans I have for you, not plans for calamity, but listen to this, plans to give you a future and a hope. How many know when we create eschatology that takes away our future, how many know it's, you're, you're, if you don't believe, if you believe the world's going to burn up, you're not going to actually be involved in changing ruined cities. I want to read you a verse that's in the Bible. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 2. This is becoming one of my favorite verses. Now, it will come about in the last days. When? Okay, let me read it to you again. It will come about in the last days. That the mountain of the house of the Lord will become established as chief of the mountains. Now, if you understand prophetic talk, this is about authorities, mountains, authorities. In other words, the mountain, the authority of the Lord will become chief above all, all the other authorities and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and they will come and say, let us come to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and we may walk in his paths. For the law, the instruction will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between nations. Listen to this. He will render decisions between many peoples, and they will hammer their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. When is that? In the last days. You go, well, that's the millennium. Well, that's your opinion, because it says in the last days. It doesn't say in the millennium. And Peter stood up in Acts chapter 2, as we well know, and he quoted Joel, which says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Isn't it funny how we receive the spirit being poured out on all flesh as in the last days, but we see Isaiah 2 as in the millennium. And I'd like to propose that we push stuff into the millennium that we have no faith to believe for it. And we say, well, that's going to happen in the millennium. And I, and I would like to propose to you, it's going to happen in the millennium if God can't find people that will believe for it now. I'd like to propose that your faith has everything to do with the timeline. God may have promised you a certain thing, but how many understand that your lack of faith will delay God's promise in your life? In fact, we have a great example in Israel in the wilderness, don't we? God said, you're going to the promised land. Do you understand? It was 40 days journey from Egypt to the promised land. It took them 40 years, and they all died except for Joshua and Caleb. God's, God's word wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad prophetic word. It was no faith. Wow. I'd suggest that many timelines in the Bible have to do with if God can find a people who will believe. What if God is saying, that this is the time when people will no longer train for war. What if, what if it's true? What if it's now? You go, well, how about North Korea? How about if we, when North Korea rises up with missiles, we go, uh-uh, oh, not on my shift. You're not supposed to be training for war. And we begin to prophesy, just like the Lord said, when you pray, believe, and receive. What if we said, hey, how many know, before you believe you can do it, you should have, you believe, you have to believe you should. Yeah. Let me say it again. Before you believe you can, you have to believe you should. And I'm saying, what if we see Iraq and Iran and, uh, and all these crazy things happening in the world, and we see North Korea, and we see people, wars and rumors of wars, and we're like, we already have wars and rumors of wars. That's fulfilled. What we haven't had in the last days is never again will they train for war. And what if we say we're the apostolic people that believe for peace? And I'm not talking about just the absence of, of war. I'm talking about the presence of God. I'm talking about how about if we begin to pray these Isaiah 2 words over nations and we say, no, no, you're not supposed to kill anybody else. And we just begin to prophesy. How many know prophecy is both foretelling I'm telling you the future, and forth telling, I'm causing the future. When Ezekiel came to the valley of dry bones, God said, can these bones live? He didn't tell God, well, these bones, you know, let me tell you 14 reasons why these bones can't live. He said, you know. We gotta have a whole lot more people who say, you know, instead of no way. 
Can these bones live? Well, theologically speaking, I don't think so. Um, you know, let me tell you about Matthew 20. Well, how about you know? Okay, prophesy to the bones. How many know he didn't prophesy about the bones? He prophesied to the bones. He wasn't call, he, was, <laughs> he was calling things that are not as though they were, and it was actually, he was actually a catalyst to the bones becoming a mighty army. How many of us become a catalyst to mighty armies becoming bones? We have to start prophesying like God prophesied. We have to start thinking that we're supposed to have a fantastic future. I'm saying the reason why all these people who don't know God are creating amazing things is because they actually believe there's supposed to be a future. And we're like, uh uh, not on my shift. I'm like, you're not going to have a fantastic future on my shift. We're going to have a tribulation. (laughs) Then the beast is going to eat you and take your children and cut your heads off. And then the nations, and then the nations are all going to bleed to death. And that's, it's all over, brother. Now, you you want the good news or not? I'm like, come on, guys. Abraham, you're going to be a father to many nations. You're going to be a father to many nations. How many know the promises are yes and amen? Not the curses. The promises are yes and amen. And we are an apostolic people living in an apostolic age with an apostolic mission. Make earth like heaven. This is the prayer. See how it is in heaven? You're seated in heavenly places. Yes, I see that, Lord. Well, make earth like that until I'm comfortable bringing my city down there. We're always praying for people to go to heaven. Jesus never prayed for people to go to heaven. He prayed for earth to, to heaven to come to earth. For earth. You know, if you get heaven in people, you'll get people in heaven. <laughs> mm, I know, we pray for people to go to heaven. They live like hell, and they figure out they're going to go to heaven. I'm like, let's get heaven in people. Let's release the kingdom everywhere we go. Let's think bigger than, at least bigger than mosque. We are the can-do people. We are the all things are possible people. We are the, yes, the city's bad, but we're here, people. We've come to a city near you. I started to tell you that I had these men together that I thought, I'm supposed to get these men pregnant. And I started telling them about our city. And I said, what if 250 of you, I was talking about the crime rate at that moment. I said, what if 250 of you every, every week walked the city with shirts on like, I'm a dad to this city. Yeah. Like 250 of you walked into the, the toughest neighborhoods and you, there was always shifts of 10 or 15 guys there just to say, hey, I'm here to bring peace. That's what I've come for. I've come to reconcile people with this. I've not come to beat people up. I've come with the spirit of reconciliation on me. And when I see this person, this person, I'm like, hey, let's sit down and talk. And there's a spirit of counsel on me and a spirit of wisdom. And I asked the men, how many of you would do that if there was a sign up? And almost everyone in the room stood up and said, count me in. They started yelling, count me in, count me in. I'm like, we can change this city. It ain't that hard. And then we can change a nation. Because if we can change a city, we can change a nation. And if we can change the nation, we can change the world. Amen. Until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. We have a motive. We've come to change the world. People are like, well, the devil has a scheme. You know, there's the Illuminati. Well, God has a scheme too. And God's isn't a secret. You know why? Because he's all powerful. He doesn't have to hide. He's like, here's what I'm doing right here. Try and stop me. Illuminati's over here. Got our secret little club. You better stay secret because we're coming. And we're not coming to Christianize the world. We're coming to help the world. We're coming to make our city a better place. We're not coming to manipulate people to pray a prayer. We're coming to better people's life. We're coming to do good works in such a way that they see our good works, our good works, not our good words, our good works, and they glorify our Father who's in heaven. I love this. You know, in the, and I'll finish with this one minute story. When Joseph lived in Egypt, he became such a blessing to Egypt that when his father Jacob died, Jacob said to Joseph, his son, don't bury me here. Bury me in Canaan. So he dies. And Joseph goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, my papa made me promise him I would bury him in in Canaan. Can I go? And Pharaoh says, not only can you go, but we are all going with you. 
And it says this, that the Israelites wept for 40 days for Jacob, but the Egyptians wept for 70 days. And when they went from Egypt to Canaan, they passed through a city of, I, I'm sorry, I think it was the uh, Amalekites. It was one of the enemy cities. And it says, here's what they said. They saw the Egyptians weeping, and they called the, the trail the place where the Egyptians wept. What would happen if you actually so benefited Pharaoh, the world, that they actually wept when you passed? That's my goal. I know that people will hate us for doing great stuff at times, but I also know that there's a bunch of people that love Jesus who were called sinners. You got to have some enemies because Jesus said, love your enemies, so you got to have some so you can love them. <laughs> but that shouldn't be an excuse for actually doing works in a way that people go, I don't know what their motive is. They must have a weird motive. Ah, no, those are the crazy people. Those are the weird ones. Those are the strange ones. You can talk bad about them, but you can't ignore them. That's who we are. Would you stand? Put your hand on your heart. Say this. I was born to change the world. I'm here to bring the kingdom wherever I go. In my city, in my, city. My, city will my city will experience the goodness of God, the goodness of God. in the land, the land of the living. Everybody in my city, in my city will, experience will experience the goodness of God, the goodness of God. In, the the in the land of the living because it's my city. It's my city. God, God is my X factor. My X factor. No, matter the bad news, no matter the bad news, the good news the is better than the bad news. In Jesus' name, in Jesus name. Things, are things are getting better. Things are progressing. Things are progressing. Government, of God is increasing. government of God is increasing. And more peace is happening. More peace is happening. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you so much.